Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here with all of you. And um, I want to pick up with that last point that Professor Gomes made in terms of the strength being in numbers. And it's so nice to be here with all of you today because it's rare to be in a room with a large group of people who are on the side of unions. And it's something that sometimes gets missed about these academic environments that we're in, where there's an assumption that we have these left-leaning institutions or maybe left-leaning faculties or student bodies, but the issue of unions, worker solidarity, is not one that you can assume people at your institution are necessarily going to side with. So I think it's a really good reminder for us to do this more often, right? I heard there's a possibility that maybe this is the first of many annual events, and I think that would be wonderful because there aren't so many spaces anymore where we can all get together. And I want to tell you a little bit about my, my path and why I feel so strongly about unions, but similar to, to David, um, I'm from a Cape Verdean family, mom's youngest of 12. I'm an only child. <laughs> I know. I don't know what that says about me either. But, um, so, uh, you know, I, I moved here uh, when I was eight. I moved to the United States. I was actually born in Portugal to uh, Cape Verdean parents. And then we moved to Pawtucket, Rhode Island, which for those of you who are familiar with Pawtucket, it was basically a little Cape Verde that was then living in Pawtucket. And so many of my childhood friends were the children of my parents' childhood friends in Cape Verde and they had all basically met one another again in Rhode Island. And so I say that to you because when I think about unions, to me, what are they really about? They're about community. They're about solidarity. They're about having a safety net, right? So when I moved to the US for the first month, my family lived with another Cape Verdean family until we could get on our feet. Another family let my dad borrow a car so that he could get to work. Those bits of help and assistance can make all the difference in our lives. And I consider myself fortunate because we had people in our community, in our network, who could be there for us in that way. That is not something that people in our society in 2023 necessarily have in their lives, right? So what networks do we have available to people so that we can carry them through the more challenging episodes in life? And for me, there's a visual that I associate with that era in my life that, that made me forever enamored and loyal to unions. Steel-toed boots, okay? What they represented to me as a little kid, my dad, like a lot of the Cape Verdean parents at that time, worked in a mill, right? He had been working in a textile factory, got his hand caught in a machine at one point. Luckily, there was not uh, long-term physical damage, but as a child, I was always worried. I was worried about his well-being, his safety at many of the factory jobs that he had, and then, he got a job at a place that was a cable company in Rhode Island, um, and they were unionized, steel workers. And one of the items that he first received, right, by virtue of being in that union, steel-toed boots. And he would get a new pair every year, and on hot days, they would have the water cooler set up, and he took me to the factory, and there would be a sign, and it would say, so, you know, so many days since there's been an accident. Because when I think back to some of the stories that we even listened to in the earlier panel, people are looking to make a livelihood, right? They're looking to make their paycheck. They're not going to work th to lose their lives or their health or their limbs or their dignity. When we think about some of these violent incidents that happen to people in their workplaces, and I think for us, for all of us, our best bet right now is in this solidarity. So I want to transition a little bit to what I then decided to do. You know, in my own life, I went to public schools in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Um, and it was, I had a 
I personally had a very positive experience in my public schools, um, but that isn't to say that I was blind to the needs that also existed. And so I went off to law school and I decided that I wanted to come back to Rhode Island. And so my first project out of law school was to actually set up an on-site legal clinic at my old elementary school, okay? So this was back, you know, I was not connected through my laptop to my workplace, so I would bring my little kit and caboodle and do all these paper intakes for people who needed uh, civil legal assistance um, and then take the cases back to Rhode Island Legal Services. So one of the first cases that I had involved a family that honestly looked a lot like my family. Um, but the father in that family was receiving Social Security benefits, disability benefits, and there had been an issue with these benefits. And so um, initially, we were just trying to make sure that the family could continue to receive these benefits. The reason I mentioned this story to you is because, well, A, it was one of those first cases that will always stay with me because they were so much like my family that I just felt so, so personally invested and I lost the first round. And I came back to my office and for any law students in the room, you will have this experience with some of your initial cases. I was just crying because I thought, oh no, this is it. This family is going to be struggling now. We ultimately were able to win on appeal, but what did this mean? This was not a big case. This is not a case that they're going to write about in the history books, okay? These are your very bread and butter cases that you might have as a lawyer. But to the client, to the client's family, these are the cases that make all the difference. Why? This was a family who had been able to purchase a home in Pawtucket. The only way they could afford to keep paying that mortgage is if they had these benefits coming in. The husband was unable to work because of the disability. They had children in school who were doing well in school. Anything to ruin the benefits, the house, the stability, that's going to impact the child in the school environment, okay? And so transitioning from that example and going back to this initial passion that I had about education equity, you start to see how you can't really address education equity in a vacuum, right? Without thinking about that bigger picture context, the environment in which the family is living in. And again, is there a robust safety net? Are there safe jobs available that pay a living wage? Is there a healthcare system that is available to individuals? One of the, um, I think, terrible tragedies of education law and policy in recent decades has been to not take that context or environment into account. What we do is we know we have communities that are isolated in terms of race, in terms of class. We have high opportunity neighborhoods and low opportunity neighborhoods in terms of the financial resources, and yet we have all the students take the same test and we declare some schools are failing schools without doing all of the other pieces that we would need to do in order to make sure that kids are getting what they need to be successful. Because without a stable roof over their head, without adequate nutrition, at their dinner table without parents who, through no fault of their own, are just so stressed about how they're going to make ends meet that they can't be there to help their child with their schoolwork, right? So unfortunately, we know that this is cutting across the political spectrum. Right? And when we look at changes in federal laws in particular that have accelerated privatization of our schools, 
the school choice movement, the attack on unionized teachers, that has come to us care of Republicans as well as Democrats, right? Um, so what do we do, right? What do we do? I think first we need to tell people, right? We need to talk to people at every opportunity. And I'm a relatively mild-mannered individual. I am, for a lawyer, <laughs> for a lawyer, with that caveat. Um, but the fights or the arguments that I've gotten into in my adult life, for the most part, have been around education issues. And primarily around the, what we miss in this debate. So you'll know this statistic, but you will know that the private sector, labor, uh, union membership has dwindled, right? Even when I mentioned that my parents had come here to Pawtucket, Rhode Island in the 80s, lots of factory jobs, lots of mill jobs at that time, while well, within five years, so many of those companies were going elsewhere, right? We're going abroad. So we've lost that. Where is the union strength today? It's public sector. And within the public sector, teachers make up the largest share. So I don't want to be conspiratorial here, but if you want to go after unions, if you want to go after labor in America, the way you do it is you go after teachers. And that's exactly what we've been seeing, unfortunately, right? So I think letting everyone know this information, letting them know this link, following the money, seeing whose pockets are being enriched through this movement, uh, who benefits from not paying into taxes and having those monies then support our local public schools, that's one way to do it, right? And the other way, I think, is exactly what we're doing here. It's solidarity, it's coming together, relying on one another, getting each other's stories out to the media. Any public school teacher that you know who's spending hundreds of dollars of their own money every year to buy books for the classroom, right? Rugs for the classroom. Um, those are the stories that we need to share with the wider community because otherwise we get vilified. It's been unbelievable to see what's happened in recent years, right? Somehow teachers are now to blame for all of these other ills. Okay, so that's my second transition point. So, I then went into legal education. And I want to just quickly tell you that this was a very surprising turn in my career because when I went to law school, I absolutely hated it. And part of it was because I had grown up in Pawtucket. You know, my, my parents, um, they themselves had not gone to college. And when I went to law school in particular, I felt it even more than I did at college where I just felt really as though I wasn't part of the prevailing culture in law school, right? I didn't really feel like I belonged, like the stories that mattered to people in my community were necessarily being reflected in the reading assignments, in the lectures. So I then became a law professor, right? As Right, as things would have it, I became a law professor. And one of the items that I try to make sure I do in all my classes is to prevent other students from feeling the same way that I did. And I just want to give you a few examples because it ties us back to where I started with my remarks. I teach property law, okay? So that makes me a very hated uh, professor. Property law is one of those topics that yeah. most most students really struggle with. Um, it can be dry. However, there's a fascinating case that I cover and that almost every property professor covers, and it's called Euclid, okay? And in the Euclid decision, this goes back to 1926, the United States Supreme Court basically said that it was okay for municipalities to zone, in essence, by socioeconomic class. Right? So you as a municipality, you alone get to decide how many single families versus multifamily dwellings you're going to have in your town. And if you so choose, 
you can have no multifamilies. Why? The Supreme Court, highest court in the land in 1926, refers to a multifamily house as a parasite. As a parasite. Now, I teach that case. I also learned that case as a student. And I remember thinking in class, I grew up in a triple-decker in Pawtucket, right? What does this say about me and all the people I knew? So you know what I do now when I tell that story? I say, I grew up in a triple-decker in Pawtucket, and I don't need a student to raise their hand and tell me that they had that experience because you want to respect students' privacy and where they are in their journey. But I tell them so that they can at least know they're not alone. You don't need to be of a certain class, of a certain demographic profile to be a lawyer, to be a law professor. Because the extreme, the other side of this that unfortunately we're confronted with in our profession, and I'll give you a quick little example. On the United States Supreme Court right now, we have two justices, Kavanaugh and Gorsuch. They both graduated from the same high school. Two out of nine graduated from the same elite private high school, Georgetown Prep in Bethesda, Maryland. Is that a coincidence? Now, I always tell students, listen, if both of them have graduated from Shea High School, where I went to school in Pawtucket, that would be a coincidence, right? <laughs> This is not a coincidence. Well, we <laughs> yes, exactly. Right? Not a coincidence. We have created a system where even though the mythology is education, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you do well in school, and you will have all of these other opportunities available to you, we know in reality that is not the case. And that is the other piece I think we need to be vocal about as well, right? Making sure everybody is acknowledging exactly what their path has been. What have been the hidden and maybe not so hidden privileges that we have all had so that other folks, particularly young folks coming up, know what's real and what's fake and they know where their best prospects lie and to me, they lie in the community, they lie in solidarity individually, unless we're a Gorsuch or a Kavanaugh or a, you know, one of these 1% folks, we can't create our own private safety net. And unfortunately, that's where we've been, I think, as a society. We've all been trying to create our own private safety net because these structures, these supports, are not there for us right now, but I think together we can build, we can help rebuild them. So that's what I have for today. Thank you. Okay.